like to introduce John Hill. John's actual title is LinkedIn Higher Education Evangelist, which is one of the cooler titles I've heard out there. Um, he is currently on a whirlwind tour of Colorado. Uh, he has been at about five schools in the past three days um, and did over 180 presentations last year to colleges and universities, both domestically and abroad, on LinkedIn. Uh, he also has a background in higher education. He worked in career services at Michigan State for over five years. Um, he's a fantastic speaker. I've heard him speak several times on this topic. And so if you're a recent grad and looking for a job, this is going to apply to you. Or if you're an experienced professional and you're looking for a better way to manage your brand identity online, there's also going to be some great pointers in this presentation as well. So if you all will join me in welcoming John Hill. Thank you, Lindsay. It's a clappy bunch. I love that. All right, so uh, I am John Hill. I'm the higher education evangelist at LinkedIn. Um, two things you're going to notice right away. I talk very fast. I'm originally from the East Coast. I was born in Boston, grew up in Philadelphia. You're conversationally irrelevant if you don't talk fast. Uh, secondly, um, because I travel a lot, I get the opportunity to see a lot of different locations. And my wife and I kind of play a game of figuring out where we want to be um, five, ten years down. So um, I've got a short list. Uh, I was on the phone with my wife last night. I've been here several times before, but you'll be happy to know that Denver and Colorado have made our short list. Potential places to live at some point. So you heard a little bit about the travels that I do, the speaking engagements that I do. Um, over the last uh, year, I've given about 180 presentations in seven countries. I had the opportunity to do about 330,000 miles in the air last year, so pretty much lived on a plane 35,000 feet. And uh, as a speaker, you start to see some um, unique environments that you might not be used to, especially when you're speaking internationally. So about nine months ago, I was speaking in England. And I was speaking at a conference for higher education professionals in alumni and career services. And they asked me to talk about how to develop an effective alumni career services network. They wanted me to talk over two days. So I was the last speaker on one day and I was the first speaker on the next day. The next day they wanted me to talk about social media as it applies to higher education, how to utilize it effectively. So when I get going, I get really excited. I start talking with my hands a lot. And uh, in this presentation, no different. Here I am, kind of whipping my hands all over the place, talking. I get done, I get off stage, I walk into my hotel room, essentially sending emails at home, hit the bed. I'm the first speaker in the morning, get up. I'm two minutes from walking on stage in front of 100 people who represent pretty much every major university in Europe. One of the nice ladies from one of the UK schools comes up to me and she says, John, you haven't spoken in front of English audiences very often, have you? I'm like, uh, no. And I know that's a bad question because nobody's going <laughs> to lead with it. And she goes, well, throughout your presentation, you kept flipping your middle two fingers at us repeatedly. And I'm like, OK. She goes, well, um, I think you call it in the US, this is what we call it here, giving us the middle finger during your presentation. So I'm like, oh, great. So I got to get up on stage. I'm about to talk. I talk with my hands a lot. So the next presentation, the whole time I'm talking, hour and 15 minutes straight, I'm talking like this, as not to offend anybody in the audience. Um, you know, it's funny, I've had a pretty good view of what the job search market looks like globally, um, how higher education is helping alumni in events like this to create opportunities for themselves. Um, I actually was hired in as Director of Alumni Career Services in October of 2007 at Michigan State University. I was responsible for 420,000 alumni. We were open to all of them. Two months later, the market crashes. I'm in the state of Michigan, hardest hit by the recession. We had 260,000 alumni in the state. I'm 80 miles away from the automotive industry, which we absolutely penetrate as a university. Very quickly, I went from getting 50 to 100 calls a week to getting thousands of calls a week. And these were people who were calling saying, I've been in the same job for 25 years. I've got the same skills. I've only known one thing, and now I've got to find a job somewhere else. How can you help me? Some of the principles that I learned through that process, I will apply here. And to give you kind of the emotional context of this, um, and this is the last time I talk about Michigan State, I promise, 
Um, I met my wife in class at Michigan State University. That's when you can say aw. There we go. Uh, we got married at the alumni chapel on campus. I had a seven-year-old who knows the fight song. I've got a 12-year-old who knows more faculty than I did when I went to school there. I was a Spartan through and through. And so there was an emotional hook to helping these people out. And it's funny, through emotion, through chaos, innovation happens. We had the ability to redefine how you do the job search, utilizing relationships as part of the process, utilizing social media as part of the process. I'm going to take you step by step through that tonight so that you can learn from the same experiences that those folks learned in Michigan through us as a university. So by a show of hands, how many of you are not on LinkedIn? So just a handful, um, which is amazing, and I'm not going to pick on you, I promise. Um, but I've been speaking about social media, specifically LinkedIn, as part of the job search for about six years. When I first started talking about this, I would ask, how many of you are on LinkedIn? It would be four or five people. It's kind of amazing to watch how this penetration has happened. Uh, but it also showcases that this is becoming your job search currency online. It is your professional online identity of record. And this is how recruiters, HR, are sourcing and finding you. So I want you to put your best foot forward. I also want you to pay attention to a couple of different principles that I talk about. One, build your network before you need it so it's there when you do. Those folks that were working in the automotive industry, when they lost their jobs, they didn't have an appreciable network outside of the automotive industry. It took us a while to get them back up to speed. The second thing, build a quality network, not a quantity network. And I'll play off the major affiliations to create opportunities for you on LinkedIn. We'll run through this. But lastly, I don't care what stage you are in your career, dream big. There are a lot of opportunities here. There are a lot of pathways you can follow. I'm going to showcase how you can find your alumni and the jobs and companies you want to get into, mobilize them to create opportunities for yourself. So that being said, let's get into the presentation, start walking around in here. Give me a second to type. It's always fun typing in front of an audience. Anybody else have eight black dots as their password? Oh, no, CAPTCHA. I'm going to focus on four main areas of how to utilize LinkedIn. I'm going to focus on people, jobs, companies, and groups. People is where you can slice and dice the 200 million users we have on LinkedIn by a whole host of ways. So you can do it by geography. You can do it by job type. You can do it by company. You can do it by connectivity. You can do it by university. We're going to take this mass of people into a small subset of people. I'll show you the process to get their jobs. We've become relatively transformative in the job search process partly because we can show the relationships you have attached to the jobs that are listed. But secondly, we can give you very deep data insights on the companies and jobs that you're interested in. Third, companies, there are 2.7 million of them on LinkedIn. Due diligence, you research the company before you try to get hired there. You can see your relationships, both by a university and your relational map within that environment. I'll take you deeply into that. Groups, there are 1.5 million groups in LinkedIn. I'm going to focus on two primary groups the industry that you're interested in breaking into, and your university groups, because that is a strong affiliation to play off of. So before we get there, though, I want to start with how I started utilizing LinkedIn, which was to manage my connections, my relationships. How many of you used a flip Rolodex at some point? They're on, like, Antique Roadshow now. Um, but you remember, I used to use one, too, so I'm not aging anybody out, except for, well, anyway. Um, a to Z, take the business card, put it in, take it out. I've always been in outwardly facing roles. I've never found that silver bullet on managing relationships. For a while, I did it in Excel spreadsheets. I've always been in outwardly facing jobs. So I'd meet in a given year 3,500 people. There's no good way to manage that mass. So LinkedIn became the source for me to manage my connections and my relationships. This is how I first started utilizing it. And you can see with Lindsay, and I'm going to have you again, Lindsay. Where are you? Come on up again. You can see on Lindsay's um, profile, you've got the name of the person, you've got their title, you've got the company that they represent. On the right-hand side, it's the amount of connections that they have on LinkedIn. And we're actually going to search somebody out of Lindsay's network playing off university affiliation. So, Lindsay, what was her name? The person we looked at earlier today. There's Colin Erickson. So... If I click on this, I can see a little bit additional information on Colin Erickson. I can see his name. I can see his title. I can see the uh, city he lives in. Scroll down a little bit further. I can see a summary of information in his words. Now, if you think of how I can use that information, 
if there are some connective pieces, if we have shared interests, if we're describing each other in similar fashions, using this summary, reading into it before I give him a call, allows me to take a cold call into a warm call. Allows me to source him out ahead of time. If I keep going down further, I can see his career experiences, his background, so how he graduated from, and he's a, a MSU person, right? How he graduated from MSU, Metropolitan State University of Denver, and got into the position he is now. I can see things like groups and news he's following. I can start to see the topical things that he's attached to. If I have those shared interests, again, it makes that call a little bit easier. So I can start to source information off the profile to figure out who this person is and make the call a little easier if I reach out to him. Now, if I scroll up, the whole reason that I'm showing you a profile is you have access to something that's relatively interesting. Contact info, if I select that. Um, how many of you, your profile right now, if you're following along, looks like this? Does yours look a little bit different? You have profile 2.0, okay. We just rolled out a new view of profile on LinkedIn. This is profile 2.0. Everybody in this room, your LinkedIn profile will look like this in the upcoming months. If it doesn't currently look like this, on the right hand side on that box where it says people also viewed, you're gonna see a box that says notes and then below it, it'll say add and edit contact information. If you click on it, you'll get access to the same thing I'm about to show you. On all my first level connections, I can, get a read of additional information. And um, one thing I'll tell you, how many of you are in the job search right now? Pretty much good majority of the room, right? Job search, looking for a job. All right, don't upgrade your subscription. Focus on your job search right now. Everything I'm gonna walk through today with LinkedIn, you can do on a basic level. So you can replicate everything I'm gonna show you. I want you to really focus on saving your money uh, for other things that you need at that point. Um, you're going to be able to do enough through quality relationships, and I'll take you through the path to develop those. But if I come down here, um, Colin could have added his phone number, his instant message, his address, his birthday on his profile when he set it up. He didn't, so it's not there. But if somebody did out of your first level connections, it would be bolded right there. If it were bolded, if it were sitting there, you cannot change that information, but you can view it. But we also add the ability for you to start adding additional information. So I can say 555-1212. If I save this information to his profile, Boomi can't see it, no, or uh, Colin can't see it, nobody else within LinkedIn can see that information. So I can start to capture the information around them. Step further, I can start to capture the relationships around the first level connections I have. So if I click on other information down here, I can say that Colin's assistant is Joe. If I save that to his profile, I have the name of the gatekeeper in between me and Colin. I've saved it to his profile. Next time I reach out to talk to him, I can personalize the conversation to get into Colin. And that makes it more effective to get through to him. Step further, I can save notes on him. Right here, if I click on this, I can say something like on 311, Colin and I talked about how great Colorado is, with a C. Colorado is. And on 312, we decided it's much better than California. <laughs> All right, round of applause on that one, right? I live in California, I shouldn't say that. Anyway, um, if I save this information to his profile, I am the only one who can view that information. Now, on the job search process, if I'm managing conversation, I can start to capture the narrative on this profile and save it here and go back to it later if I'm trying to mobilize him to help me out. So essentially what you're seeing is an individual customer relations management tool. And it doesn't cost you anything. So you can start to keep the notes on the people that you're connected to on a first level connection. Better yet, if I come out of here, let's go back to that contacts page. If I come down to connections, and I scroll down to this area, and scroll to export connections, on all my first level connections, I can export, the, export them to a CSV file. That's a fancy term for Excel. So if I wanna manage my relationships back in Excel again, I can take all that information you just saw off my first level connections out of LinkedIn, onto my desktop, do whatever I want with it. 
We're the only social medium that allows you to remove that type of information out of the system. Now, the beautiful thing about LinkedIn is how we set up as a relational map. How we showcase how you can get from point A to point C utilizing relationships along the continuum. And I'll take you step by step of how that looks. So, say for instance, you and I are not connected on LinkedIn. All right, but you're connected to her and she's connected to her. Once you and I connect, you become a first level connection. You become a connection of a connection, second level connection. You become a connection of a connection of a connection, third level connection. You and I join a group together, we can see everybody in the group. My relational map. This is how it plays out, it's very linear. What's your name? Maria. Maria. Everybody give Maria a round of applause. <laughs> Maria is the most important person in the room right now. She is what's considered a weak tie. So let's go back to that quality relational map. How I build quality relationships on LinkedIn. What's your name? Lynette. So say Lynette, what school did you go to? Metro. Metro. Everybody give a round of applause who went to Metro. All right, whatever. Uh, anyway, say uh, Lynette and I both went to Metro together, all right? University affiliation. The four major affiliations you can play off of to go grow an effective relational map. Number one, friends and family. The problem with friends and family is a lot of times their network isn't big enough to help you out or isn't aligned with what you want to get into. I have nobody in my family who's an evangelist or works in social media. So I don't have anybody to talk to for professional reasons out of that grouping. Second major affiliation you have, university affiliation. You all have that in this room right now. Third major affiliation you can play off of is shared work experience. I worked at a company called Gannett. If somebody from Gannett were to pick up the phone and give me a call, I'm likely to take that call. Fourth major affiliation you can play off of is volunteerism. Board work, committee work, causes, uh, any student groups, any ancillary fraternity type groups that you're attached to, those are good networks to tap into. So let's say Lynette and I connected because you went to Metro and I went to Metro. All right, we've known each other forever. We went out and got beers when we were on campus type thing, right? It was a great time. She asked, was it fun? Anyway, we had a great time. Platonic. Anyway, um, so we build a relationship based on that university affiliation. You've done the same thing with her. All right? If I asked you to connect me with her, are you likely to do it? Sure. All right. If she asked you, you built the same relationship with each other. If she asked you to connect with me, would you do it? Yeah. This completes the relational triangle. What you are considered is a weak tie. A weak tie is a connection of a connection. We have found that 85% of job opportunities come out of not your direct connections, but a connection of a connection. Weak ties. There are 100 people here. By amplification of networks, there are 10,000 people here. That's why this is a very important person, but it's also why it's important to build a quality relational network. Now, what's your name? Maria. Okay, Maria is not as important in this equation, so give her a round of applause to make her feel better. <laughs> Maria is a connection of a connection of a connection, third level. You'll notice that we've started to minimize your view of third level people on LinkedIn. They have their last initial now. The reason is, in that relational map, She's least likely to help me out. She's so far diffuse from connection to connection to connection. But, your name? Courtney. Courtney, we're in a group together. We've probably joined a group on one of those shared affiliations. She may help me out. So she's still pretty worthwhile in this whole scenario. I should pump that up a little bit. There you go. You're doing all right. So, that being said, Let's take you into how you can start to source out the information on LinkedIn and look at people and take people down to a appreciable level of relationships that you have. Who's the number one person you would ideally want to connect with in any company? My boss, is that what you said? That's awesome. Uh, ultimate decision maker, CEO, I heard a couple people say it. All right, so let's jump in here. We'll go up to title and type in CEO. We'll do a search, and in the U.S., 837,000 CEOs come up on LinkedIn. It defaults to current or past. The past were abject failures. So we'll only look at the current CEOs, <laughs> and I can now see, and I hope none of you are on that list, I'm sorry, um, 665,000 current CEOs. 
Name a university in this room. Regis. Regis. All right, I'm going to pick on Regis later. I heard DU. I'll go with the University of Denver. So I can pop down here. I'll pick on a lot of you guys. Don't worry about it. So University of Denver. Do a search. And I can see 936 CEOs that graduated from University of Denver that have a profile on LinkedIn. Name a city, any city. Chicago, or that first. Come down to postal code 60601. And I take this out. Um, by the way, there are like eight zip codes that I remember off the top of my head, 90210 being one of them. But I'll take this down to 35. And I can now see the 22 CEOs that graduated from DU that live within a 35 mile radius of downtown Chicago and how I relate to each one of them. Those are third level connections, connection of a connection of a connection. This is actually Lindsay's profile, not mine. So I'm using somebody who doesn't even work at DU to show you this. But if you think about that, this was the bastion of Fortune 50 companies 10, 15 years ago. They could build databases parse out information at this level, they had the money to do it, it's now in the hands of the individual. Everybody here can do what I just did. You can source out information at this level. So step back for one second. Um, I used to talk about um, that search for CEOs and how you can view all the C-level people on here as the white pages for the C-suite. I used to talk about those degrees of separation talking about the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Some of you guys have heard about that before. So the problem with that is I go to a lot of college campuses, not only talk to alumni or faculty and staff, but I talk to students. Students have no idea what the white pages is anymore. <laughs> and they also don't know who Kevin Bacon is. <laughs> Hopefully that's turning, he's on TV again, but it's kind of surreal. Anyway, let's go back just one step because I want to look at a second level connection. And who's my person? What's your name? Sharla? Okay. Sharla, you can see some of these people are second level connections or CEO. Nick, Mike, David. Pick David or Nick. One of those people. They have a picture. By the way, your profile is seven times more likely to be viewed if it has a photo. Pick one of those. David. All right. Chief financial officer, SEC reporting consultant and auditor. That sounds very serious. That coming from a higher education evangelist. All right. So if I scroll down, I can see, again, summary of who he is and what he's about. I can see um, his background, so the roles that he had. One point I want to take is I can use this as a career trajectory of where I could go. Essentially, what you're seeing is how somebody went from the classroom to the C-suite and the walkthrough on that. One thing I want to point out, we've started to really dabble in personal branding. We believe that's going to be the job search currency five years from now. A lot of what you do as far as influence that's showcasing online is starting to be captured, and HR is starting to use that to see, are you somebody that might fit the roles that they're interested in? To give you an example, look at the first four areas of skill and expertise and endorsements, mergers, SEC filings, financial reporting, and accounting. He has a lot of people through a lightweight endorsement who've clicked on him and said he has this skill. It's his network defining he has this skill. For people who are in recruitment offices, this is a sign that this person might be somebody that they look at if they're looking for somebody who has one of those four skill sets. It's not something to worry about right now as the job search goes, but five years from now, it could redefine it. If I scroll down a little bit further, I can see certifications, I can see education, I can see organizations, I can see connections and the groups he's attached to. By the way, if you come by somebody's summary in a job or company you're interested in getting into, you can see they're in a group that's attached to the university you came from. That to you is a low-hanging fruit person to reach out to. LinkedIn does not force people to join university groups. The university does not force people to join groups. Somebody is connected back because there's an emotional transactional hook back to the institution. They just raise their hand to help you out in some way, shape, or form, or at least increase the odds that they might take a phone call if you reach out to them. All right, so this all being said, if I scroll up on the right-hand side, Lindsay, where are you? Okay, I can see in Lindsay's network the three people who connect me with David. Courtney, Joyce, Brad. Courtney's sitting right there. Courtney, there you go. Connects me, so how do you know David? 
Now, there you go, association on the volunteer side. All right? So there's the relational connection. And I did not plant you, did I? No, all right, there you go. It's like a magician. Look what I did. Uh, anyway, if you look at the name, the title, uh, up here on the profile, the name, the title, if you look at the company that he works at, if you look at the location, if you were to take that information out of here and do a Google search, do you think you would find a phone number, if not for him, for his company? You're likely to do that. What's the most effective way to communicate with somebody? Face to face. What's the second most effective way to connect with somebody? Phone to phone. Online is the least effective way to reach out and connect with somebody. I'm an evangelist for a social media company in the heart of Silicon Valley, and I'm telling you, stay away from technology when you get to this point. If you think about it, David graduated from the same university, and this search, we'll refine this a little bit, but let's say this was University of Denver, all right? I have the opportunity to reach out to him and connect with him based on university affiliation. I might pick up the phone and give him a call and say something like this. My name is John Hill. I'm a graduate of DU. Really interested in learning a little bit more of who you are and what you're about. I wonder if you'd take a few minutes to talk to me about that. In that two-sentence structure, you've done two very powerful things. Number one, you positioned him as the expert in himself. It's very Dale Carnegie-esque. People love to be the experts of themselves. It's a conversation extender. The second thing that you've done is you play into the intrinsic value of somebody from University of Denver giving back to somebody from University of Denver. University affiliation is a very, very visceral connection for most people. We lose that in the relational map as we go along. We start to forget about it as we get into our career, but I want to prove how powerful that is. Think back to the current, say, Think back to your time at university. Now think back to the current students who are there, and if one of them were to pick up the phone and give you a call and say, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about who you are and what you're about, by a show of hands, how many of you would take that call? And if you don't raise your hand, you're going to hell. <laughs> I don't have that power. But anyway, if you put it up late, it doesn't matter. Again, I don't have that power. So, So let, let me say that everything I'm talking about increases your chances of getting through to these people. All you're trying to do is increase the odds that they'll pick up the phone. Will everybody pick up the phone? Absolutely not. Will somebody rebuff you? Absolutely. But you're increasing the odds that somebody takes that call playing off those affiliations. If I get that person on the phone, I'm asking them how they got into the position they're in now. Because the reason I'm picking up the phone is I'm interested in working there to begin with. If I ask them how they got into that position, they're giving me, again, a conversation ex extender. They're talking about themselves. The next thing that I want to talk about is what the work environment's like. It allows me to try on a suit on what it's like to work there without actually going to work there or going through the interview process. Next, I want to ask what type of opportunities become available. If I ask what type of opportunities become available, it allows them to tap me into the hidden job market, jobs that might not be visible right now. But the most important thing I can do, and by the way, this whole process is called informational interviewing, and it's utilizing relational connections to get to this point. The whole thing that I'm talking about, if you can get your resume or your LinkedIn profile in his hands after that conversation, there are four things he can do with it. Number one, absolutely nothing. Does that harm you at all? No. Number two, share it with his network. Who are people like David connected with? Other CEOs. Number three, he's in a meeting. Somebody says, hey, we have this opening coming up. I just talked to somebody from my university. They might be a good fit for it. You just tapped into the hidden job market. But most important, he takes your resume down to HR. You become an internal referral. What do you think that does for your chances of getting a job in his company? They go way up. And I can tell you, having anybody in HR here? All right. A couple different piles, right? Web-based submissions that just come in in mass and internal and external referral. Which one do you spend more time looking at? Internal, external referrals. All right, so everything I just showed you, that walkthrough I just showed you is very complicated, how to get all the way down to that. 
you guys are here at 7 o'clock at night, starting to wind down. You'll get home. You'll have to get back into the family craziness that you always have. I have my own family craziness at home, 12 and a 7-year-old. Drive my wife and I nuts, love them to death. But they will sidetrack me for a while. So I might end up not getting on a computer until about 10.30 at night to walk through what I just showed you. What you will remember is the fast-talking guy wearing a hoodie and a sweater vest, and not necessarily that walkthrough. I want to make sure that you are able to view data in a way that you can parse it out to help yourself long term. We developed a tool on LinkedIn to make this a dashboard, make your university more visible within the platform. So if I scroll up to contacts and I hover over it, we built, so what I'm going to see are the two universities that Lindsay graduated from, Boston College and the University of Georgia. And if I click on one of those, so say Boston College, I can now see alumni from the institution that she went to by where they work, where they live, and what they do. In aggregate, 1900 to 2020, if you were looking at my profile, it's Michigan State University, this is 1990 to 1995, five-year plan, I really enjoyed college. So it would look a little bit different than hers. If I go over to that right-hand side, I promised to pick on a specific school today. Where's my Regis contingent? Where are you at? You got to go woohoo or something. There we go. Awesome. My meds are too because I have kids here, and I've done. I'm back in school because I want to go back to work. There you go. So I got my first degree in 82. Okay. Number two for Metro State in, in 2011, so I'm Metro State as well. Had to go to Regis because I want to work for the college. And they won't let me here until I get a master's. All right. Regis University, 1900 to 2020. Every alumni and student that has a profile on LinkedIn is in this space. 32,054. Where are my Regis people? Where are they, the Regis people who work here? Where are you at? How many alumni do you have? Take a guess. I'm going to guess for you, 80,000. We have about 35 to 40 percent of your alumni on LinkedIn right now by where they live, where they work, what they do. What you are about to witness is pretty awesome. If I click on see more, I will let anybody pick. Front row, you can see this a little easier. Pick a geography of where they live. Not Denver. Too easy. San Francisco, great city. Not as good as Denver, though. 562 people. If I select that, where they work and what they do, just change to reflect the people who graduated from Regis University that live in San Francisco. Pick what they do. Right-hand side. Engineering. So if I select engineering, 45 people who graduated from Regis University that live in San Francisco, 25 companies change to reflect that. Pick a company. Huh? All right, I'll pick Google, and I got a funny story about that. But Google, San Francisco, Google, Engineering, Regis University, and I can see the two people on LinkedIn that fit that. Now, this is Lindsay's map. Lindsay did not go to Regis. But one of those people is in her network, Chuck, graduated in 2012. You can see he's a third level. One of the most important things you can do right now to make this tool usable, connect with 30 people from the university you went to. In this room right now, there are probably 30 people from your school. Maybe not Regis, because we've got the one yoo-hoo, yee-haw. Uh, but you want to connect with the alumni with the faculty and staff, with those folks that are attached to the institution who can open up this tool for you to view those people at a second level connection that you might be able to pick up the phone and give a call to to get into the positions, the areas you want to get into. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. All right, so cold call into a warm call. I also like doing this. If I scroll back out of here, oh, by the way, that's my drop the microphone moment. I can walk away. Um, that was pretty cool. Uh, but Google, I got a good story for you on this. Um, I didn't know much about LinkedIn. I mean, I knew a lot about LinkedIn, but I didn't know where they were physically headquartered, where their buildings were. We're actually in a cul-de-sac in the middle of all the Google buildings in Silicon Valley. 
like literally, there are 25,000 Google employees around these 1,500 people who are huddled in this one cul-de-sac that work at LinkedIn. And for the first year that I worked there, I commuted from Michigan. And that's a long commute, by the way. Um, so I used to fly out, and I would stay there for a week. And every time I flew back, I swore that the Google companies around us had moved two inches closer to our <laughs> campus. And knowing Google, they probably were. So it was, it was fascinating to watch. But Take a cold call into a warm call. One other thing that you can play off of heavily is interest. So somebody share an interest with me that is not educationally based and is not work based. Softball. Softball is actually a cool one. I've never used that before. Softball. Every word on a LinkedIn profile is indexable. So if I come down here and search profiles, if it makes the conversation easier and I want to talk to somebody, and I know that they have the same shared interest as softball. I can see 115 people, students and alumni that graduated from Regis, that have softball on their profile by where they live, where they work, what they do. That's fascinating. Digging deeply into data, all right? Play around with this tool. 30 university connections make this invaluable to you. Overall on LinkedIn, to make it usable, it's about 50 connections. So let's take you a step further. Let's take you into the socialization of the job search process. How many of you have heard of Simply Hired? All right, Simply Hired is a job search aggregator. They scrape off jobs from public sector, private sector, nonprofit, academic job, uh, websites, public repository jobs, put them all in one place. So it's the online universe of jobs available. Indeed is very similar, all right? So if I jump into Simply Hired, we don't own Simply Hired, we just have a relationship uh, we have a connection with them. The connection is called an API. An API is just connective tissue between databases. You guys would know it. How many of you have visited ESPN, CNN, MSNBC, Huffington Post at some point, and you see your friends on Facebook like the stories that you like? That's an API. It's connective tissue. It's socializing the web. So Lindsay, pop up here for a second. Before we do the, uh, pick a city that you might want to find a job in. Portland, Oregon? Are you serious? Sure. All right, sure. <laughs> I love the commitment. All right. There, let's scroll out of here. So, let's go into Portland, Oregon and do a search. And now I can see there are 38,412 jobs in Portland. What do you want to do? Wow, that's specific. Okay. Instructional, oh, look at that. All right, let's see how many jobs, 155. All right, see this little IN over here, LinkedIn logo? If I click on that, Lindsay's gonna connect her LinkedIn network to Simply Hire. And now I can see the people that are in my network on LinkedIn. Scroll down a little bit, Lindsay who connect me with the jobs that are listed there. Whoa. It's awesome, isn't it? This is what we all wish we had 10, 15 years ago. It's like the college students coming out, I'm like, you don't know how lucky you have it. We actually had to really know people offline. So <laughs> now I can see, and I could play off, the best relationship I have on LinkedIn to connect me into the jobs that are there. I want to take you full circle on this. I can identify the jobs. By the way, you can also do this on LinkedIn jobs. I can identify the jobs I'm interested in. I can attach my relational network to it. Find the best affiliation I have. Pick up the phone, give them a call, do an informational interview, get my resume in their hands. Takes it down to HR. I become an internal referral. Increases the chance that I'm going to get a call back from somebody in HR. Land an interview. Find out somebody's going to be interviewing me. 85% of Fortune 500 companies utilize social media as part of their vetting process, which means they have accounts on social media. Find out the name of the person who's interviewing me. Look up their profile on LinkedIn. For the first time in history, I have the resume of the person interviewing me. I can play off the relationships, the connectivity, the information on their profile, and it's perfectly legal. I checked. <laughs> now, you want to be careful with what information you use during the interview process that you get out of social media. You don't want to say, Hey, I notice you live at 414 West Geneva Drive. Because <laughs> that's creepy and you won't get the job. But there are subtleties that you can use with that information to help you out. 
And part of getting through the interview process is making a connection with the person who's interviewing you. Tying like interests is a way that you can do that. So what are we going to do before we even get into the job search process? Start talking to somebody? Make sure our information's right. Well, that one definitely. But are we going to research the company? Do our due diligence, right? All right, 2.7 million companies on LinkedIn. And if I pop up here, I can jump up onto companies, and I can search companies, and I can search companies. I hate that that's a two-step process. 2.7 million, almost 2.8 million, and I can see the amount of people in my network, so for Lindsay, 747 people, and the amount of jobs that each one of those companies has. Pick a company that you might be interested in working at. Real company. Liberty Media, what do they do? They are uh, consolidators for the Relatively big? Yeah. All right, let's look at Liberty M Media. Are they owned by somebody else? No. They are not. Geez, oh, there we go. Liberty Media. So they have. 10, oh, they're big, big. All right, now I'm embarrassed. So I can see name of the company. They actually don't have much information here. That's interesting. Did they strip it out? They stripped some of it out. One thing I can see, Lindsay has five second degree connections. If I click on that, where'd you go to school, Liberty Media? University of Denver. All right, 89 people who have a profile, Liberty Media. If I come down to school here, yep, it's right there. I can see the three people that graduated from University of Denver that work at Liberty Media, how I relate to each one of them. Did that through that, back to that reverse original search. Now, one other thing you can do here is you can toggle between people who work currently at Liberty Media or I could look at people who used to work at Liberty Media. If I reach out to somebody who graduated from University of Denver that used to work at Liberty Media in an informational interview, they'll tell me everything. <laughs> they have no dog in the fight. So they'll tell me the right people to connect with. They'll give me the right information of who I might be able to grease the skids to get into Liberty Media. I'm going to say that again. How do, uh, company, you can come up on the search and toggle between current company and past company uh, on a general search. Let me scroll back though. I want to continue to go through company pages real quick. Let's pick another company. Home advisor? Like I'm going home advisor? Okay. Oops. All right, internet company, right? All right. So here we go. Home Advisor has actually used this, and they're using this page to recruit talent. Are you? Do you work at Home Advisor? Yeah, there you go. So you're spying on your own company. Awesome. So I can see recent updates of what Home Advisor is talking about. A lot of companies are going to post jobs here. They're posting kind of narrative. It's good to capture what the ethos of the company is, what they're talking about in this space. Now, again, I can click on the 32nd degree connections or the 232 employees total on LinkedIn that work at Home Advisor. If I scroll down, look at this. I can see the six most viewed company pages by users outside of Home Advisor. So they're clicking on Home Advisor and they're clicking at most the largest amount, these other six companies. This is my competitive analysis. Home Advisor, would you say some of these companies are direct competitors in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. All right, so more insights. If I click on this button, this is where it gets fun. I can see people in my network who used to work at Home Advisor. Somebody used to work at a company, what does that mean? There's an opening behind them. If I start viewing the companies that I'm interested in, start looking at this information enough, 
I can start to see and position for openings as people change their LinkedIn profiles to new jobs, I can start to position myself for openings that don't publicly exist yet through view of data. Now this profile, you're relatively new. You guys relatively new? All right. You, somebody on your account has turned something off. I'm going to bring us back in just a second. Let's look at IBM. So most company pages they come down here, are also going to show employees with new titles, which means these are people who have been recently promoted or people who have recently been hired into a company. If somebody's recently been promoted into a company, what does that mean behind them? There's a job opening. Now, another way to look at this, if I look at the people who were recently hired by this company, if I start to look at the profiles of the people who were successful of getting hired in a company, I can start to see some aggregate similarities between summaries that they're writing, the skills that they have, the expertise that they have. If I have those skills or expertise, if I can craft my summary a similar way, they're giving me a roadmap of how to change my resume to submit to the company based on successful resumes in the past. So another way that I can use that, on the right-hand side, I can see where employees came from before they came to the company. If I know somebody there, I can connect with them and have them help me out. I can see the aggregate top skills based on LinkedIn profiles, five top skills of employees of the company. If I don't have those on my resume or my LinkedIn profile when I'm submitting a resume there, it may disqualify me in some way, or on the flip side, it may accentuate my resume as I'm trying to push it through the process. And then I can see the beautiful people most recommended. We'll skip those. So I come up to groups. Two types of university, or two types of groups that I want you to talk about. First, let's look at interests. Name an industry that you want to get into for a job. What? Education policy, that's pretty niche. That's a good one. Higher education is easy. We're all over the place. So education policy, um, and I also will look at higher education real quick, but I want to share a story. I was speaking to a group of law school students at University of Pennsylvania about two months ago. And I asked the students, what kind of law do you want to practice post-graduation? One of the students said, I want to study or I want to practice mining law. I had no idea what that was. In fact, I thought he was joking when he said it. So he wasn't. But I'm like, God, there can't be a lot of people in mining law in here. And one of the ways that you can use groups is you can start to connect with people in the industry you want to get into. They potentially have opportunities because they know the industry. So we went up here and we typed in mining law. And there were 17 groups associated with mining law, including the top one, that had uh, 1,200 members. I was shocked. But I told them, you join this, and you've got 1,200 people who are in this very, very niche area that you might want to connect to. But let's look at education policy. If I come up here. I can see that there are 391 groups associated with education policy. The largest one has 2,800 members, and it's classified as a networking site. Where's my education policy? That's a pretty good group to join. Your university groups. We have what, Lindsay, 10, 11, 12 schools represented here? Aggregately, you probably have 1.5 million alumni attached to this room. There are a lot of people out there. Join the groups from your university. When you do, you want to engage in conversation. But I want to tell you something straight out. Do not ask for a job in that space. If you ask somebody for a job in a network like that, there will be people who want to help you out. They just don't know how to help you out. Getting somebody a job is a very weighty thing. It causes paralysis. Also happens in your offline network. Ask for advice. It leads to the same place. What's your name, education policy? James. James. All right, James. I go into this education policy, I might say something like this. Um, 
I'm really interested in breaking into education policy. Where do you want to work? What city? Denver. In Denver. Not quite sure how to break into the market. What advice do you have for me? People will respond. For whatever reason, they will. And we watch it happen time and time again. Those people who will respond, they'll respond with their advice. That's important, but what's even more important is that you bring them close to your fold. You create them as career search ambassadors for you. They have just raised their hand to help you out. Mobilize them to help you out. Now one thing I will say that LinkedIn did very, very wrong that I want you guys to all be cognizant of going forward. We did this little thing that if you try to connect with somebody on LinkedIn, become a first level connection, we say, how do you know them? No, well, we do say, how do you know them? But we do the, I would like to add you to my network. All right? And some of you guys just send that out. I would like to add you to my network. All right, so I'm going to give you what I say um, that makes me feel when I get that. That our relationship is so important that you didn't put any additional communication or context to the note of adding me to your network. Those are the two things you want to do. Customize those as you get a chance. Put it in context of why you want to connect with the person, and then also give them a reason to network with you as well. Showcase what value you bring to the table. So, groups, ask for advice. Great place to engage, learn narrative around an industry, learn where the opportunities potentially are. Let's go into profile. And I would start with view profile. I'm going to pop down. Oh, Lindsay, I'm going to look at mine. All right. So a point I want to make here. I've got on my resume, I believe changing the world can be more than hyperbole. I would never put that on a resume, but I can get away with it on my profile. All right? Here is a way that you can start to define your personal brand. You can start to define what work means to you above and beyond the quantifiable data that you find on a resume. You can start to add dimension to you as an employee, and in social media, it's actually applauded in a lot of ways. You want to keep it in professional context, but you want to use this almost as a quasi cover letter. And I'll tell you one reason why. How many of you have copied your resume almost identically on your LinkedIn profile? Remember I told you 85% of HR officers are looking at your profile on LinkedIn? They already have your resume because you submitted your resume initially. So what you've done is duplicated the view of what they see of information on you. You want to use this to accentuate the information off a resume. You want to use this as a second cell. So think about your LinkedIn profile, in essence, as part cover letter, part resume. Now, additionally, there are some areas above the resume type information that when you set up your profile, um, we capture your educational experience, your work experience. If you look at the uh, right uh, area, you can see that you can additionally add to your profile on LinkedIn projects, languages, publications, test scores, courses, patents, certifications, volunteering, and causes. You can give a broader view of who you are as a potential job candidate. And we give you some of the structure to do that. Now, who's looked at who's viewed your profile? It's like the most voyeuristic thing on LinkedIn. I look at it every 10 minutes. So I'm going to pop up and I'm going to look at who's viewed Lindsay's profile. So if I come up here, seven people in the last day, and I can see, for instance, somebody from University of Colorado at Boulder looked at her profile. Say Lindsay interviewed two days ago at University of Colorado, Boulder, and today somebody looked at her profile from the university. What does that tell you? They're interested. They wouldn't look otherwise. It's not an absolute. Not everybody is going to look at your profile. But for the first time, you have a gauge of interest and employer in you as a candidate. Now, last thing that I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to step into a story. You have the opportunity to search the updates of your network. Name another company here that you're interested in. Avaya? 
phone company? If I come up here and do a search on Envia and updates, whoops, faulted. I can start to see the 3,245 people who have mentioned Avaya in their status updates on LinkedIn. If I read this enough, if I start listening on social media, I can start to see the customer relations issues that Avaya has. I can start to see the communication issues that they have, the logistics issues that they have, the things they're not delivering to their audience. And by the way, how many of you are on Twitter? All right, Twitter is an incredible search tool for this type of information, and people will say anything. They're completely honest, almost overboard honest. But if you're not on Twitter, you don't have to get on it to search it. If you go to search.twitter.com, and you can search for these company, this information on these companies. If I start to see aggregate patterns of what people are saying around the brand, around the company like Avaya, and I go into the interview process, and in the interview process I say, hey, I've been listening in on social media and I see that some things are being said about the company. And you come into that interview process with solutions to some of the problems that the company is having. If you're a solution provider in the job search process, my HR folks, what does that do for your chances of getting a job at your company? Go way up, right? Way up. All right. So I went through a lot. I know that. Uh, but I wanted to give you as much coverage as possible. I always love leaving with kind of an inspirational story. By the way, I am going to stick around, and I'll answer any questions you have until midnight if it's necessary. You got me for a while. Um, these guys paid me well. How much did you guys pay me? <laughs> Nothing. But <laughs> the cool thing about this is uh, I like helping people out as much as I can. And we've got a tool that can do that. And I want to give you kind of an inspirational story that's out of my life. Uh, when I was director of alumni career services, I tried to help students as much as possible. It wasn't my primary job, but I loved connecting with students. And there were a few students that really, really utilized our office and our resources as much as possible. And there's one student who I ran across. His name was Caleb Thornhill. He was a former football player at the university I came from. Middle linebacker, played in the mid-2000s. He was a legacy football player. His brother played in the late 90s. His dad played in the 60s. Caleb could have rested on his name, found jobs anywhere for the rest of his life. He was totally hell-bent against doing that. He was, when I met him, getting his master's degree in athletic administration. He was on the fast track to end up working at a major sports conference in the U.S. Had all the ties, the lineage, the relationships, the knowledge. He was incredible at offline skills, positioning himself with his unique selling position, what he was about. Caleb comes to about four or five of my career development events that I'm doing on campus or around the area. And about the fifth one, I pull him aside. I'm like, Caleb, what are you doing coming to all these? I get sick of hearing myself talk all the time. You've got to be really sick. And he goes, now, every time I pick up one or two things and I apply them, it's been relatively successful for me because I think I know what I want to do in life. Can I come and talk to you about that? I'm like, of course you can. A couple weeks later, I get a knock on the door. He wanders in. And he goes, John, I figured out what I want to do and I need your help. He goes, I want to be a player development coach in the NFL. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> there are only 32 of those positions. They rotate like every four years. It would be easier to get him into investment banking in New York than the NFL. But we look at our networks on LinkedIn, and one of us had a connection to the player development coach of the Detroit Lions. The offline principles are still at play here, guys. You've got to be good offline as part of the job search. Caleb had the intangibles. He was good enough to position himself after a conversation with that player development coach for a one-year unpaid internship with the Detroit Lions. Any of you work in major athletics? It is the least glamorous environment internally. It looks beautiful from the outside. I worked in it for five years. You work 80, 100 hour weeks. You don't get paid exorbitant money unless you reach a certain level. Caleb is the grunt, lowest, lowest, 80, 100 hour weeks. Now he's living in Detroit, which offsets costs a little bit. But 
he gets done with that year internship. Detroit Lions come up to him. They're like, Kale, we loved what you did for us this year. We loved it so much that we're willing to give you another one-year unpaid internship. <laughs> Kale picks up the phone and gives me a call. And he said, hey, John, I'm not quite sure if I can do this. He said, I really, really want to break into the NFL, but I don't know if I can afford to. At this time, he's 27. I said, Kale, I can't tell you to not follow your dreams. That's up to you. Serendipity has that funny way of happening sometimes. Miami Dolphins fire their player development coach. Those coaches are friends with the Detroit Lions coaches. Call them and say, hey, do you know anybody? We got this position opening up. They said, uh, maybe. Caleb's coach calls him and says, hey, there's an opportunity in Miami. Caleb gets in the car in Detroit, drives 24 hours to Miami, buys a suit along the way. <laughs> He's Googling the coaches as he's going down, trying to learn about them. Camps out in front of the player development facility in Miami. Each coach comes out. He positions himself as the right candidate for the job. Two weeks later, he's named the youngest player development coach in the NFL. Now, I'm a huge believer of pay it forward. Give, give, give to your network with no expectation of receiving. I ingrain that in Kayla. I'm like, you get this opportunity. You got to pay back. He and some other the player development coaches in the NFL they started a nonprofit called Fourth and One. They were looking to connect inner city student athletes in football to campuses, 15 and 16 year old at risk. Take them on campus for a week to teach them about mind, body, and spirit. Help them be better human beings. Had nothing to do with football. Caleb takes all of the resources that he can muster at the NFL, brings them there. But the first speaker that he has to come and talk to them is me. I'm talking to 15 and 16 year olds about LinkedIn. <laughs> they can't get on our plat platform until they're 18. <laughs> but for him, it was a showcase of future forward. What could be the pathways that were here? I don't care what stage in life you are. There are opportunities here if you go after them through the networks that are available. I want you to all dream big, and I thank you so much for having me in this great state. Mm -hmm.